Uh, welcome, everybody. And um, I'm Victoria Mars, as some of you have heard or seen. And uh, I've been really delighted to spend the last day and a half uh, actually experiencing one of our programs. So I am uh, the current chairman of Salzburg Global Seminar. And one of the most important things about being able to talk about the seminar and what we do is to actually experience a program. Because it's one thing to read about what we do and to hear about what we do. But I think the only way you can really promote your organization is if you actually experience it. So thank you, thank you for allowing me to share in that. And so how did I come to Salzburg Global Seminar? Um, I actually um, have spent quite a bit of time in Austria and have a very strong connection as my parents built a house back here in the 60s. So it really is my second home. And then as my profession, um, until I retired from a paid profession, as I said, I'm not retired. Um, when I talk about, you know, we, we, we here at Salzburg, we talk about current and future leaders. So am I, I'm, I know I'm a current leader, but am I also still a future leader? I, th I think so. Um, but in my paid profession, I was an ombudsman. And what does an ombudsman do? It listen, an ombudsman listens to people as an active listener and tries to come up and help people come up with solutions to resolve the issues that they have. So when I retired from that job, I was like, huh, this sounds interesting. I think I might be interested in joining this organization, which I did. I joined the board of directors and very soon thereafter, they asked me to be uh, the leader of this organization, as chairman of the organization, and I said yes, and so here I am. So I'm, del I'm delighted to be here. So today we're talking about the Center for Education uh, transformation that we've been able to launch, that was launched in, in October. And we were able to launch that because we've had a, a, a campaign, a leadership campaign in the last five years. I think you know, organizations, not-for-profits, are always trying to raise money because the only way we can actually do all these things is by, by raising money. But it was a successful campaign, and that has enabled to do, us to do many things, and one of them is to actually launch this Center for Educational Transformation. So as I think about what the purpose of that is and, and, and how it can help. I think my experiences in the last day, day and a half, have helped me with that. Because what do we do at Salzburg? We bring people together to help them share their thoughts and ideas. And to me, that really is about creating a learning mindset. What is a learning mindset? To me, a learning mindset is where you expand your mind and your perspective. Because we all have our biases. We all come in with our views on things. And the only way we can all really grow, and the only way we can actually hope to transform uh, systems or hope to transform anything is if we actually expand our minds. And so I want to thank you all um, for helping to expand my mind and to help me to continue on my learning journey as I experienced um, our, our program. So why, why now, I think, is education so important? And I think I probably would start with, you know, how do you define education? I don't know if you all did that at the beginning, but education is so broad when you talk about education. But, but why now? Why is it so important for us to start now? I think because we have, the last couple of years have been challenging. If, if education didn't have its challenges beforehand, I think the last couple of years have made education even more challenging. You know, COVID made it so that none of the children that normally would have gone to school were even in school. That doesn't even address all the children that never go to school, but it just added on to what already was a problem. Um, the structural inequalities that exist out there were there before. They were just made worse underneath COVID. And then if we talk about the whole climate crisis and what's happening there, it is also impacting education, however you want to define education, the learning, the opportunity to learn and, and to, to, to grow. And so I think this is 
a, a perfect timing for us to be able to, to launch this, this center. And I'm actually really proud that we launched it. And I'm actually really excited um, that we're actually going to be able to launch our inaugural lecture. Um, that is something that will happen um, every, every year, which hopefully will be great um, as part of this program. Um, so, Shanaz, I. When did we first meet, Shanaz? I mean, I feel like I see you, in but June. in June, was it yeah. only in June? Okay, yeah. but it, it feels like I've seen her familiar face um, so many times. And, and so I'm really <laughs> excited to be up on stage with you. Um, amazing, you've you had an amazing influence um, in helping um, transform education um, by actually focusing on learning and development and the systems in, in South Africa, where I think you've made a big difference, and I think all of us can, can learn from that. My understanding is your lecture is titled How a City Used Access to Education to Work for Women, and is a fantastic, mm -hmm. it's a case study on how we can actually unlock education for more and more people. So I can't wait to hear your lecture. I'm glad to see, so glad to see you again in such a short period of time. And I hope that we will continue to be such an active fellow that you have been since 1997, um, that you will continue to be an active fellow and involved with also a global seminar. So we really appreciate you. So thank you. And with that, I will trade seats with Dominic, who will come up here because he actually will be moderating the conversation afterwards. Um, so we will trade seats, and I'll go from there. So thank you, everybody. Everybody that's here. Uh, and those that aren't here, because I know there are people here virtually, too. So welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I am deeply honored and grateful, and I feel a bit nostalgic um, about being here and for this great honor of coming to connect with you um, and coming to tell a story, a story that has meaning for me, a story that has meaning for a city that needs um, inspiration and hope and what's possible in the world. So I greet all of you. Um, I thank all of you for showing up, to coming to connect and engage. And I'm really pleased if there's any of our colleagues uh, online. We hope that um, you, know, you can bring your voices into the room as well. I come to this conversation about how a city used access to education uh, to work for women as part of a larger agenda to wake up government systems. I've always had the privilege of working in large systems, and I feel really at home in doing some of my best work with others in large systems. And, you know, I came first to the Salzburg seminar um, 25 years ago, and it's half of my working career. And it has shaped, and it has influenced, and it has boosted, and it has helped me to locate myself within systems in a much more strategic, much more skilled, much more savvy way in order to navigate the politics, in order to influence um, and create the change that the system did not know it needed. So working on the inside of large systems and change from that place is an important opportunity for us as change agents and as practitioners. And some of us work from the outside in, right? And both those spaces are important. And for us to connect the dots and to collaborate from the outside in and from the inside out. And allow me to share some of these specific pieces with you. I want to share with you about how I locate myself in the story about using education to work for women in the city, in our capital city, Pretoria, the city of Tswane, its new um, democratic anti-apartheid name. And I want to tell you about how it 
how working for women is an essential part of how we want to solve our problem in that city. And it's, it is a larger story for the backdrop of South Africa as a whole and many other developing nations. I want to tell you about what are some of the contextual and real stubborn legacy issues that we're dealing with that makes change difficult, that makes change hard, that make change dangerous. And I want to tell you about the kinds of interventions that we ran, right? What's working? What are we noticing? How are we pushing uh, the system? How is the system resisting and pushing back? And how do we engage you know, in that space? And then I want to end off with a piece about how do we stay alive when we drive big system change. Right? So that's how we want to talk the story. So we know cities, and many of us work and live in cities of a range of different makeups. We know cities are places of hope where people come for a better life seeking great aspiration, people move geographically to access better services, better health care, better housing. And we also know, you know, with the large-scale urbanization that the world's experiencing, many cities are also places of unmet hope, you know, places of disappointment, places of unmet needs. And it makes for paradox, it makes for a range of particular pressure points um, and tensions in how cities are governed, how cities are led, um, the politics of the urban city politi politics, right? So with that as a backdrop of cities, working within local city government, it puts an enormous pressure on any city government in order to respond to the range of developmental needs that a developing country like South Africa is having. So being a child of apartheid, having grown up an apartheid story and message to me and many others like me, have relegated me to a second class citizen status in my own country have scripted the story for me that, you know, your ambitions, your life chances is here, you know. The quality of education that you're going to be exposed to is going to make sure that you become a factory worker and nothing more, because that's what, you know, the script for, you know, you and others like you is. Also, I know the world hasn't been built for people that look like me, much less a role like me, right? And opportunity is not going to be handed to me. One has to fight for opportunity, you have to create opportunity, you have to, you know, your activism gets born in such a context very early on, where your sense of identity gets tangled up into what the state, what the politics of the day says who you are and what you're going to become and what's possible for you. So resistance and, you know, learning to resist and give pushback to this narrative that, you know, I want other choices, right? I want to, you know, be sure that I can, you know, become who I want to be and everyone else. Um, you know, gets to access opportunities and choices where they can redefine their own future and not the future that was set for them. So we know that, you know, from recent World Bank reports and from our own lived experience, South Africa is regrettably one of the most unequal societies in the world. It's regrettably known for, it's hard to say, the rape capital of the world. Gender-based violence is one of our daily lived horrors. I'm sitting in this wheelchair because of gender-based violence. So it's part of my reality consciously and unconsciously. So our government is awake to this reality, struggles with this reality, not winning with this reality. 
and understands that given our history and where we come from, the big equalizer is going to have to be, you know, fought on the battleground of skills. We're going to have to claw our way out of poverty, out of underdevelopment, through skills development at an aggressive pace, at a large scale pace, because skills was the way in which our society was choked, deprived, and only the kinds of skills to keep you in the working class, to keep you for cheap labor, to keep economic slavery alive. So part of my work and where I you know, battle a transformation agenda on the daily basis and why I deliberately chose the portfolio of learning and development, that being a seat from in which within a system one can make real change happen and use it to mobilize and roll out skills development that makes a real difference in breaking multi-generational, intergenerational poverty, right? And the particular story that I want to talk to you specifically about is how we are using that to not just develop skills, but to be audacious enough to develop skills amongst black young women, African women, in male-dominated trades and environments, so that we can not just transform the livelihoods and economic participation, but penetrate and transform industry in very deliberate and very overt ways. The story of our context. You might say that, you know, South Africa, the rainbow nation, the story of hope, the story of Madiba, Mandela, 28 years ago. And the reality is the world over. Democracy is not a level playing field. You know, politics um, and the way politics manifest, um, it's not a friendly space for women, right? Societies don't elect women in great numbers. It's difficult to move societies to say, when is South Africa going to have the first female president? You know, what is the discourse that holds that back? So within this context, it's really important to understand how, you know, and I think in the words of, um, is it Caroline? that mentioned the work of Caroline uh, Criado Perez. And yeah. thank you, Dominique, for introducing me to her revolutionary work. I love her revolutionary spirit. And she says it best. She says it, the world of work needs a wholesale redesign of its regulations, equipment, and culture. And this redesign, led by the data on the female body, needs uh, needs and female lives, women's work, whether paid, unpaid, is the backbone of any society and economy. And it's about time we value it. And I anchor the story with her words in that regard, because we know that if women don't occupy positions of power and influence and authority, the men on those seats aren't going to change it at the pace that we need it changed. I heard one of our participants say in an earlier session today, I do not have the patience to wait for the system to change, right? We're going to need to drive that change very actively. So this stubborn legacy of getting women into male-dominated trades in the work that we do at our Leadership and Management Academy, it's got a stubborn legacy. That legacy comes from Artisan work in South Africa was the preserve of white Afrikaner men that were the architects of apartheid. Access was controlled in who got into the trades. Jobs through legislation was preserved that African men could not become supervisors. They could only access limited trades and not other trades, right? So that kept the, you know, the job reservations well intact. And this was well from the late 1800s into the early 1900s. So we're dealing here with a stubborn institution 
of what kept many South Africans, majority of South Africans, out of well-paid, skilled, mid-skill level, label, level jobs. So getting women into these trades is but only the beginning. Getting them into these spaces, they face patriarchy, they face discrimination, they face stereotyping, they face safety issues um, in the workplace. And, you know, we need to understand how these white Afrikaner culture locked out, you know, uh, both men and women that did not look like them from these spaces. And there are three particular themes that came up that link so perfectly with our conversations over this past two and a half days. So there's a, there's a gendering of artisanal work. And that goes to the female body. You're not strong to do physical work. Your shape, your size, you know, mediates against you, and we need brute physical force, right? And we know what that looks like. Another key theme that came up in how ageism and the racialization of artisanal work. So, in our workspace today, for us to train a young female apprentice, She's going to need to be mentored by who? The white Afrikaner experienced male that's been there for generations, and it's been a trade handed down from generation to generation because of the job reservation. So you can imagine the confronting racism, confronting ageism, and the stereotype, the narrative of white people does Competent, they are competent, they do quality work. I would rather want my car to be fixed by an experienced mechanic. Don't give me, you know, um, an African young man, an African young woman, because, you know, inferior quality. That's still very much part of the racist reality that we are unlearning in the system. We also have situations where language discrimination in the artisanal field plays big, and we know how big language has been for us in our conversation. And let me tell you how it plays out, because there's a special interest in language. So it plays out in this way. Language discrimination takes many forms in the workplace, but generally it refers to the unfair treatment of an individual or group based on characteristics in their speech, such as accent, the size of their vocabulary, their syntax. Now, many of us here are not first language English speakers, right? Um, so the size of mine, your vocabulary would, you know, be very different depending on our exposure and our education. So it also involves a person's ability or inability to use, you know, one language instead of another. And here's the crazy thing. Most South Africans are competent in five to seven different languages. Black South Africans, which are the most South Africans. And here they are thought of is as incompetent because they can't speak the English language, right? Or the Afrikaans language that is a particular barrier for them to get trained, to get through their mentorship, to get, you know, trade test ready. So the power to hold language hostage, you know, and the student's progress hostage, that, that is a particular political game that's being played within the artisanal culture that we are confronting and that we are intervening in. So the interventions that we ran goes like this. Three years ago, when I joined the Tswani Leadership and Management Academy, and our pride is the technical areas of work, and we've built up a reputation over many years of you know, being really good. The smaller municipalities came to us for training because it's really high quality, high pass rate. And I asked them, so how many people of our, everyone that have passed, how many people get taken up in the is industry? How many people land jobs when they're done here with us? They said, well, 80% are in employment, and the 20% that don't get jobs 
um, are just because, you know, they have themselves to blame. That was code for they are lazy, right? They've got a toolbox, they can make a plan, you know, they can just get on with it. I said, let's fact check that because, you know, my instinct told me, ah, where's the evidence for that? And I asked him, so get on our database, you know, I want to know, give me the evidence that this is indeed true. I was not surprised with the findings of what came back. The opposite was true. And what was disturbing that the team that, you know, gave the story, they were very complacent because their job ended by we're getting as many students through and tray tested and that's where our job ended. And not understanding what a job means to break intergenerational poverty for a black African woman that can earn a mid-level skilled salary, right? And we said, we've got to intervene in the space. You know, our job don't end there. Our job end in getting women into meaningful workspaces, safe workspaces. Um, and that's where, you know, our real transformation agenda became. So we produced getting more women into the industry. We, you know, significantly increased our quotas. We've got 52% women in all of our training programs. They are the highest in their pass rates. And these are some of the other system interventions that we find. We said, I don't want to rely on research that's been done in the industry. I want local in-house research. I want to speak to every artisanal woman that's on our programs right now and ask them what is their lived experience in the system, what's working, what's not working, so that we can get all of our interventions to be really nerve-pointed. And these, is, these are the things we found. One size fits men. And there's a story with that. And it's so symptomatic of the system that's designed by men for men in the way our workstations are, in the way, you know, the tools are designed, in the way the program is run. So one size fits men, you know, had a very literal experience for us. So they need to get their protective gear, their work clothing, their overalls. And we could not get the sizes to shape to fit the African body, the African female body that needs a small size for the top and a bigger size bottoms. And our stores just couldn't supply what we needed. And we had to have a sit down with both the stores as well as the manufacturers to say you are going to produce size three female protective boots. You know, if your assembly line doesn't currently do that, you're going to have to reset to give us that, otherwise we're going to take our business elsewhere. You are going to give us the sizes that we need, you know, and not just saying, well, the top and the bottom needs to be the same size, you know. We want it in the way we want it, and are you going to be delivering that or not? So this became a, a rallying call for us, this one size fits men, to look at in all sorts of other spaces, where is it the one size fits men that we have to interrupt and shift? Transforming gender norms um, and dealing with how we are violating you know, social norms with producing mechanics, Plumbers, you know, electricians, uh, fitters and turners, tool makers um, that look very different for industry. And we had to deal with that on multiple fronts. So when we do community outreach works, stopping a number of leaks, you know, in communities, um, households would tell us, don't bring me a female plumber. Don't bring me a female mechanic because, you know, what can she do? Right? If I needed a plumber, why? Why would I call a woman plumber? And we had to do, you know, community education, community participation interventions to start shifting that narrative. To say, these are our daughters. These are our sons. What are you saying? Right? Where's the pride? Where's the affirmation? Um, and that's an ongoing, you know, deep uh, work that we need to do further. Also within our own system. You know, we had to shift uh, both in speaking with industry and also placing our students at the various depots for the experiential work. 
We had to do work there on saying, you know, this is part of the work that we're going to do and um, ensuring that you are not going to have the choice in who gets placed in your depot, right? Um, and doing gender sensitization, gender education work. Feelings of safety was a big thing, uh, given our South African story that I mentioned earlier, and particularly looking at what are the things that make women, our students, our apprentices feel safe, what are the issues of the ablution facilities? What are the issues on, you know, overall security, lighting, you know, commuting to and from these different workstations? What are all the different conditions that we need to be alive to to create both psychological safety for learning to happen, as well as actual safety in the way we plan and provide support uh, for women um, working in these different sectors? My last and special piece, role modeling. Now, we know from STEM studies research, women students that are mentored by other women perform way better. And that is true for our students too. And just a few days before I came here, we had our first female apprentice that started with um, us in 1997 come and be an inspirational speaker to our now 360 students, of which 52% are women, um, across the different years of their trades. And, you know, coming to tell the story and rolling out a larger mentorship program so that we can see more women. And one of the things that our women students told us, why are we still being trained by white Africana men? Why is none of our instructors people that look like me, right? I don't feel comfortable going to speak to a male instructor when I have my menstrual pains, right? And part of our pipeline that we're building now, we've got five people uh, that will be retiring in the next year and the next two years, and all of their positions will be filled by women, right? That we are currently having that are very ripe and ready from both internally and externally that will come into those positions. Lastly, dear friends and colleagues, doing this work as change leaders, as change agents, it's very important that we understand the energy, the stamina that it takes to stick with this work. It takes time to shift the system. And there are three important ideas that I would like to leave with you. One is we're going to need to really understand that we're going to need to differentiate between ourselves and who we are as different and separate from the roles that you occupy. Secondly, we're going to need to differentiate, and this came up for us in uh, day one already, when we built community, we're going to need to distinguish between who is our allies in the system for helping us do the work and who is our confidants, and not to confuse the two, because we will pay the price if we confuse the two. And how do we use that as a resource? And the third and final piece, <coughs> seeking sanctuary. Where do you go for nourishment, for support, to regroup, to recover when the system is just taking so much from you? Right? Where is your safe space? This is a sanctuary for me, the Salzburg Global Seminar Series. It's a space where we can come and regroup, do some of our best thinking. But in your everyday life, where do you seek sanctuary? Right? Is it part of your self-care regime, right? How are you doing on making sure you have all three of those um, available for you? And I want to end off with our team as the finalist for the Apolitical um, Global Public Sector Awards presently. We're the finalist for the Learning and Development uh, Team of Champions. So please do vote for us. We will <laughs> post the link, right? And it's part of acknowledging this work that we are trying to do to unlock system change. 
and we're using the narrative of how is the city working for women to keep that theme alive in the institution, to ask that of every service, so that when I sit and speak with the chief of police, how is the policing service working for women? When I speak to our head of health, how is your portfolio centering women and girls, right? And how are we responding? All the, you know, all, do we have programmatic interventions that speak to the challenges that we have? And how do we get really intersectoral collaboration? And all of this work can only happen if we build coalitions for change within systems, right? Far too often do we get burnt out, right? Because we don't have those support systems in place and the coalitions for change that we need to build for the work currently requires of us to work cross-boundary, to be boundary spanners, to work, you know, intersectionally and to collaborate in, you know, unconventional and new ways and to look at how do we not just work with the usual suspects. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you. So, Shanaz, thank you so much. That was fantastic. We were so grateful when you accepted the invitation to give the inaugural lecture for the Education Center, and that was phenomenal. Um, I wonder if we could start at the end of your lecture, and if you would mind elaborating a little bit on what you were saying about the importance of anchoring self for change leaders. Um, so I think you made three points about the importance of distinguishing between self and role, about understanding the difference between allies and confidence, yeah. and then about the importance of seeking sanctuary. And so have you developed specific strategies that might be of interest or use yeah. for people in the audience for achieving those three things? Thank you, Dominic, for that great question. So part of having had the opportunity of you know, being exposed to real, to be plugged in globally, is that my career peaked early, right? And when your career peaked early, you find yourself in your mid-30s kind of having already run the gauntlet, you know, run you know, the corporate ladder within government systems. And you find yourself there within playing at a political level, right? Where you're the senior administrator, the senior official. Um, and when politics change or when you have political fallouts uh, with the government of the day, um, the price you pay is you get ejected, you get evicted, you, you, know, you get unceremoniously removed from your role. So I had to really, you know, with the help of my mentors, learn this lesson that I am not my job. And I think we are at danger, many of us, where we over-identify so much with our roles, with all the passion and the heart and the hours that we put into it, that because, you know, that's how we drive ourselves, you know, and the risk is when those roles end, who are you? What remains? Who are you separate from your role, right? I remember when, um, you know, I left my five-year contract at the age of what, um, 39. I was packed up and ready because I could read the political signs. Um, you know, I left the building, I went home into my kitchen with my son and my husband there, and I sat and I cried. And my teenage son couldn't understand why I was crying, and he asked me, why are you crying? And I said, I wasn't finished. It doesn't feel good when you put your heart and soul into it to be kicked out in this way, you know, and I, I feel that, you know, I'm not done. Um, and finding my way back from that place and needing to draw on my mentors to say, okay, I need to, I need to redefine me 
separate from my role. Because the thing about understanding and distinguishing self from role, we need to understand when you hold positions of influence, high profile jobs, the very next day, people are not going to return your calls as quickly as they would have. You're not going to get things done that people would have just gotten done for you. You know, you're going to have to be your own secretary. You're going to have to memorize your own diary, right? You're going to have to, okay, you know, all of the infrastructure and the support and the status symbols and the flying first class and all of the, the trimmings that came with it is no longer there, right? And you're going to have to adjust. And it's important that you know who you are and, you know, um, go there. Secondly, about, you know, not confusing confidants and allies. This is such a high-stakes piece. So please, you know, if, if this is you, please see how you want to work with it. When we are in high-pressured roles, high-stakes games, we often want to find a sense of closeness with people around us. Your secretary is not your confidant, <laughs> right? They know a lot about you. They know have a lot of access. But don't think they're your confidant. Don't make that mistake, right? It's about people that you need to get the job done, that you need to collaborate with, that you need to build alliances to move the agenda forward. They are your allies, and they are mostly people in the sector that you operate, inside your organization, and so on. Your allies, is best to keep them outside of your workplace, right? Don't think your ally is your confidant too, because you might leave certain pieces of you, certain pieces of your, uh, your ambition, certain pieces of your thinking aloud with them. And they might not intentionally use it against you, but it might become opportunistic at different times, particularly when you work in highly competitive environments. You want to be a little bit more discerning, a little bit more guarded, a little bit more sus. Right? It doesn't mean you're going to be suspicious about everyone, you know, but just, just be, don't, don't overshare, you know? Don't tell everyone your life story, right? Be, be a bit more circumspect about what you leave when, being a, intentional about it. And your confidants are those people that got your back. They don't give a damn if you get the next promotion or not. They are just there for you. You can go to them in a safe space and say, Esh, I messed up. I made a bad judgment call. I should have known better. And they are the people that's going to tell you, hell yes, you're stupid. You should have known better. How could you? Really? And they can dust you off and pick you up from the floor and say, now go out and go and fix it. And come back and tell me about it. Right? They can help to see you in your vulnerable state. They have only your best interests at heart. They're not competing with you. They are not your rival. They are not counting how many publications you're putting out. They're not keeping score, right? And I think the last one, it's important that we have spaces where we nurture our souls, where we nurture the parts of us that we neglect, right? It, it can be as simple as daily taking yourself out into a space where you can just breathe and just think or just take a walk or just, you know, have your favorite moment and cup of something that you feel, okay, this is my moment, right? In whatever form or shape that is, you know? And there's a fun story that goes with us. There was a colleague that for two hours, once a week, she go and locked herself up in the ladies' bathroom. Funny one, she had her own story about that. <laughs> you, you said you felt your career peaked early. Having heard you speak, it's very hard to believe that it's peaked and that there's a lot more ahead. Um, you're here participating in um, a program looking at education, transformation, and gender. And when we were preparing for the session, one of the, one of the things that I read was a, a, book, a new book by Laura Bates, who's a British journalist and activist, called Fix the System, Not the Women. And I thought what was fantastic about the story you've told in the lecture is how it is about addressing systemic 
challenges and that education is one component that needs to be addressed, but there's a much wider set of issues. And I wondered, because you have an incredibly rich activist background across many different sectors and different identities, how that activist background helped shape the responses that you've been driving to the specific challenge that you've talked about in the lecture. Thank you. I love that question because I'm just feeling I'm coming alive in new ways and there was a word, Adelaide, that you used this morning that I want to connect with now when you use the word infiltrate, right? So, system change requires multiple points of, you know, entry, of infiltration. And one's got to be really deliberate, right, about where and how do we really intervene in systems and you need multiple leverage points. And within the system, so I arrived in the system three years ago and part of being an activist and taking the activist in me wherever I go. So I grew up in the, you know, as a, you know, an anti-apartheid activist, um, as, you know, in, within the youth student movement. Um, I started using this wheelchair at the age of 17. So my own political awareness um, combined with you know, a sense of human rights, disability rights, it all converged. And I understood that, you know, whether it's me as a young child and the choices that I want for me um, and every other kid, um, be it now that I've got a newfound reality about how I'm going to navigate my world without this wheelchair blocking me from my aspirations. Um, I understood that all of these converge and the intersections you know, in all of my multiple identities is about that I'm fighting on the battlefield of human rights. And it's about making sure that in all system spaces that I enter is about what is the agenda that needs to be influenced with, within the system. So part of the, using the, uh, the, uh, my activism to unlock change in other parts of, of the system that I'm part of right now was driving a big culture change initiative. And the thing that I do and that I think bosses that if you had to ask them uh, what, what, uh, what makes it difficult to, to manage me. <laughs> I don't ask permission to do my job, right? So I don't go like a typical bureaucrat to go and write a report, do the feasibility assessment and get the budget and okay, now go and ask and they give me permission, right? I create the work so that the work becomes compelling itself that, you know, it happens without you know, them having had to put a stamp on it. So it's about you know, driving culture change in the organization and then talking about, okay, so I hear women speaking about bullying in the workplace. What is it about this culture that tolerates this, that allows this? How is sexual harassment managed in this environment? What is the policy gaps? You know, what is it about cases that don't get attended to? And starting to put the spotlight there, we created the conditions for the first senior manager to be fired for sexual harassment. That was previously untouchable in the system, right? And this is part of creating coalitions for change so that women can feel, can have a safer space to come to and say, I can't go and speak to someone else, or I've spoken to my managers, nothing happens. I've reported it, nothing happens, right? Um, and then, you know, intervening, supporting, you know, taking on the issues so that the spaces that I occupy, I would, you know, make sure that it cannot get ignored. Um, because I'm just not going to take no for an answer. Okay. Um, I would, we have an amazing audience here, and we have people watching online on many different platforms, so we have about 20 minutes left for q and I'm sure there are many questions in the room and online. Um, if you're in the room, please wait for Valeria or Helia to come to you with the microphone um, so that the people watching online can also hear the question. But we'd love to open it up. 
So the question I'm going to ask Karina to help me to put that on Mobilize and make it available. So, yeah, please. And we can share where to vote across the different Salzburg global social media platforms so you can find it there. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Victoria. Other questions from in the room? Around? Yes, please, Yvette. Hello, thank you so much for, for your presentation. My name is Beth Hutchinson. I work with the British Council. Um, I've got a quite a personal question, really. Um, a, a member of our family uh, is in a she's in a non traditional role, and the city where she lives decided that they would use. Would it help if I stood? Um, they decided that they would like her to be the face of you know her of her uh, her profession. Say, well, you know, look, we've got a young woman doing a non a non traditional role. But she said to them, well, that's fine. But her question was, would, will that allow me to continue to be my authentic self? And I think there's something about young women getting opportunities to be in non-traditional roles. We, but in so doing, what we don't want is for them to then feel, well, OK, I've got to keep my head down and I've got to do exactly as the men did. But we want them to bring themselves to the role and the, the, the diversity of thinking that comes with that. And I wondered what you do to support young women around bringing their authentic selves in order that the, the business benefits from, that, from the diversity of their thinking and their ways of doing. Thank you. Thank you. Sister, what's your name again? Yvette. 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 Great question. Thank you. So... One of the premier programs that we designed for the system was in September of 2020, we rolled this program out called Leading Self. It's a six-month intensive program uh, built for busy public servants. Um, it's got individual coaching, group coaching, peer uh, connect across the system, different levels. Uh, we've taken all the boundaries away from who usually get access to these different leadership development programs. And we designed it with this particular name, Leading Self, so that people can get re-anchored and re-rooted in who they are in the system, right? with the roles that they hold, with a deeper understanding of you know, you know, all their talents and gifts that they bring, right, and owning that and showing up in the space and reactivating their own agency and getting to know themselves in really profound and deeper ways, right? And we are now, you know, currently midway through the fourth cohort. So we are building communities of practice within the city of Tswane with this alumni taking on other issues within the system, where they are working beyond the current roles, to saying, here's an issue in the system. I have appetite and energy to pay attention to this. Who else is with me on this, right? So that community allows younger employees, newer employees, young graduates, first time in the workspace, to find support, right? To find spaces of, okay, how do I navigate this space? I've got a coach, a professionally trained coach, an internal panel of coaches that I work with where I can go and do some of my safe space work, right? To decode who am I in this space, right? What's the dominant stuff? What's the difficult conversations that need to be had? How do I skill myself and get prepared, you know, for that? Um, I hope that helps. Thank you, Yvette. Had an interesting question um, from Bianca Herzog, who's watching online, um, who said, could you say a bit more about the role of meaningful youth engagement in creating systemic change? Yeah. So a big part of our mandate, we look after learning and development for the city employees, which is 22,000 employees with about you know, 8,000 contract workers. And the second part of our mandate is to create employment opportunities for youth. So the programs that we run, the three-year skilling program in the technical fields for youth, 
It costs, what, 200,000 per participant over the three years. So it's a, it's a big financial investment um, with other particular costs going with it. Um, so the youth programs that we run within the city is also saying we're not just skilling up youth, we're also making sure that the quality of training that they get is multidisciplinary. So that we're not training every uh, technical um, expert or te uh, technical practitioner to go and take on a job because we've got 37% unemployment in our country. Not everyone's going to be absorbed in a job immediately after qualifying. So we're going to need to unlock the entrepreneurial spirit of our youth, right? Um, so that from year one, those that are planning to say, by the time I graduate or before I graduate, I want my business set up. So we brought in those resources to really skill people up to look at what's the seed funding, what's the support, getting our youth development agency and other partners involved um, that does this entrepreneurial training so that there's that added support so that people you know, can exercise that option and looking at how they could set possibly up cooperatives, a couple of people team up and saying, you know, we want to set up a particular workshop, we're going to need machinery, we're going to need particular equipment, and so on. Um, and the support agencies that provide that service walk alongside their businesses for a couple of years. Right. Um, so we are. We don't have good uh, evidence from the results that we're getting from that work. We've just, you know, started to implement it. Um, so we'll watch that very closely. Um, and parts of, we've got our economic development uh, department that does a lot of work also with other agencies at uh, rolling out community-based uh, youth development opportunities because there might be some youth that don't want to complete a full three-year program. I just want a shorter course so that I could be a support person in a particular uh, partic skill field and so on. I don't want to have to go the whole you know, yeah. uh, three-year period. I hope that helps, uh, Bianca. And I'm in Paris in June of this year, and then again in New York, just before the UN General Assembly, there were two big global education summits looking at the idea of education transformation. And one of the themes that emerged across both programs was the importance of intergenerational leadership in this space. And one of the most striking phrases that I heard in the New York event was I think from several different of the, the young leaders or the younger leaders was that youth leadership is an abdication of responsibility at this point in time, and what's needed is intergenerational leadership. And I wondered, in your context in South Africa, what initiatives were coming through that were helping drive that kind of change? Mm. I think we, 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 we're not doing enough collectively, but there is some particular self-organizing structures that's happening. So within our own organization, we've started a mentorship program, a mentorship program for women where you know there are so many volunteers that were just that were just needing space to be convened you know for in across a number of professions and they've been matched up with a number of different people so we currently've got a pool of 28 mentors um, with a you know, 75 different, you know, mentees matched up across that and with a waiting list. Um, so we desperately need to grow our mentorship pool so that we get, you know, younger people, you know, more experienced people within the system creating that. I'm part of a network born out by um, a dear older big sister. And it started with her being curious about her, her own daughter, and she called it, you know, spying on her own daughter to say, what are the kinds of challenges, you know, when you, 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 you get your first job, what's life like with your first, how do you, what do you do and where do you go with your first heartbreak, you know, your first job promotion that didn't go so well or that's going so well that you feel out of your depth. What are the stuff you're not coming to your mother to? Where do you go? What's the support systems available? And born out of that, she convened everyone that she knew in a network and everyone else that joined in. Um, the organization is now called Trans uh, Traversing Liminality. 
you know, that space of the in-between, um, early career, how do I drive myself forward, and an entire network of mentors, psychologists, coaches, that are volunteering our time and traversing liminality, check it out. Um, it's now becoming a continental you know, footprint where we've got young women from many different African countries accessing mentoring, accessing psychological support, having monthly master classes where we're reaching out on a number of different topics, uh, where we've got coaching circles going, um, you know, intergenerationally when we had our end of the year uh, bash recently. We've had, you know, storytelling from women that, you know, in their 70s um, and young women that have just graduated about, you know, how, what, what's the world like for you now and what's some wisdom and what's some wisdom that we need to harvest from young women themselves. Um, about answering that very question that Yvette asked, you know, what does it mean for me working in um, corporate South Africa, right? That's got a very masculine culture that looks like this. Um, you know, what does it, you know, I feel out of my depth, how do I, you know, locate myself in the system so that, um, you know, I can feel that I belong. We have many students and faculty from PLUS, the University of Salzburg, here with us today. So we'd welcome a question from anyone from PLUS. But while you marshal your thoughts, Friha, I'd love to hear. Shanas, I feel like your lecture really spoke to me as a person, particularly the last um, sections on uh, stamina. Um, I think many of us in the room identify with all of that. Mm. My question to you was, you know, given the intersectionality of your identities, what values do you ground yourself in as you build these coalitions for change in the system? Maria, thank you for asking that really question that lands right here. My purpose, my mission, is to show up with all of my humanity, with all of my vulnerability, and make a difference with my presence. And I can only do that with others when I'm extending a hand, and others will do the same in response. That shares such a common agenda. So I go and look you know, for people. So, so you've got to be, and you are that already because that's how I experienced you. You've got to be a positive emotional attractor in any space. You've got to be a magnet that, you know, gets the work activated so that you can find each other in the system, you know. It's no coincidence that our internal coaching panel formed they were somewhere in the system, right? And it was just when somehow people discover each other, we find each other and say, hey, we've got great work to do together, right? And they've all got their own other jobs, but they spend more time, you know, at the academy whilst getting that job done. So the sense of abundance and time and space, it's as if time opens up. They have the energy, the stamina, the brilliance to do more than two jobs, you know, and being good at it, right? It doesn't mean, you know, they are being unrealistic about the number of hours that they have to put in, but it's just a sense of when, you know, when you work from that place of love and big-heartedness, you know, things happen. And I must just say, so part of not asking for permission in systems, right? We know the budget rules, right? So all of this work that we've activated in the system required zero cents. The coaching team delivered 900 coaching hours within one financial year without a cent. All done internally and with volunteers and others from other institutions. So money is not the key ingredient. It's necessary. 
Lara, did you raise a hand? Thank you. Um, so, first of all, thank you for this um, great presentation. It was very, very much inspiring. Um, so, what I took away from this is that for system change, we need to change the um, objective structures on the one hand, but on the other hand, we also need to change um, narratives and the traditional norms. Um, so, I guess my question would be, um, what needs to happen first, or is it even possible to only look at one um, at a time? And can we even afford to only uh, look at one at a time? Thank you. Laura, thanks for that question. It depends, Laura. It depends. Every system's got its own unique craziness, interest, you know, um, dysfunctionalities and stuff going on. So, as you know, as a change agent, you, you learn to develop a smell and a feel of the place, <laughs> right? You being, you know, your own uh, Sherlock Holmes in checking where's the opportunity, scanning the environment, you know, where, where, where are the issues ripe? Where's the opportunity to launch? So the culture change work, I'm head of learning and development. There's a unit called, uh, that's responsible for change management. And how I got to lead culture change was I was sitting in a meeting one day, the managers were lamenting about poor performance as if, you know, it's not on their watch. And I was listening in and I'm thinking, this is really crazy. And the, the, the head of the organization uh, resolved, oh no, we need to do a, um, a, a culture survey. And I said, oh, stop, no. You don't need to do a culture survey. Culture survey is passing the buck. We've done many of those. We've not acted on it. I've seen the data. We've got a poor track record on that. Staff are not interested in filling it out anymore because we don't take them seriously. So a survey route is just you know, deferring the difficult conversations that we need to have. And I said, we need to ask ourselves, how are we part of creating this problem? Right? We are part of this mess. It's not outside of this room, it's inside this room. And give me three hours of your time, let me get you into the room and we start the conversation. Right? And that's how the Culture Dialogue series started, of a year long of conversations and of really understanding what are the system issues and having the unconventional unconven conversations so that people can be fe feel heard you know, in saying their truths and understanding it, um, so that the mirror can be held up. The stuff that can come through that the survey, you know, wasn't, the, the survey wasn't the legitimate tool. We needed to find another legitimacy um, to really get the story out. Um, so sometimes it's just the right moment about what's the kind of interventions that, you know, where the opportunity presents itself, and you wanna, you know, see where you can take it and connect with others and drive the work. You know, when the change agent team saw that, you know, I convened and had all the executives in a room, they came in reluctantly, kind of like, who are you? This is our thing and, you know, very territorial as it is in these silos. Um, and now, you know, they can't get enough of me. I can't get enough of them. I have fallen in love with them. We've gone on a journey together, right? We're doing different learning programs together, right? Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's game on. So it, it, it started very sticky, right? Who are you, you know? You're new to the system and all of that. And say, so listen, you know, I'm not here to take over your job. So I've, you've got to make it You've got to pull them in and say, I'm not here to show you how to do your job better. I'm just saying we've got work to do. Do you want to do the work or not? Right? Okay. Please, thank you. In the red scarf. Hi, I'm Nichols. Um, I'm very interested in the topic of education and would like to hear your opinion on a question. I have the feeling many children go into education very curious and playful but don't come out very curious and playful. And they are more just trying to get things done, to get grades, to get jobs. Um, and I have the feeling nowhere, wherever you go on the world, the education system is far away from what it should be to harness this playfulness and curiosity. And one of the best 
learning experience I've had were far away from education systems and rather on computers, just me being weak on, on some playful things. So what is your opinion on your ideal education system? Mm. That's a big question. <laughs> and I'm not going to do justice to it, but the part of the question that I will bite on is this. So another old friend of uh, Salzburg Seminar Series, an old deep friend of mine, Amara, that did some programs with you before. I did some work for her on uh, research on growth mindset um, in our local schools in Cape Town, my hometown. And um, we looked at, you know, children that were exposed to growth mindset um, and classes and children not exposed to growth mindset, you know, methodologies. And the teachers that were prepared to facilitate growth mindset and teachers not. And presenting and writing that research, you know, with Amara and working with, with, with the World Bank on it, it clearly showed how the performance of the children exposed over three, you know, th you know, three years following them through their grades, what the difference it made in their, you know, their performance, their confidence, um, their, their general sense of it, it looked like they, you know, they got reconnected with their own spontaneity, curiosity, and, you know, it's like the, the switch has been, you know, flipped, right? They were reactivated. Um, and the kids that were not exposed to that experience um, were pretty much, you know, um, stayed the same, um, some deterioration, some progress, uh, but nothing's, you know, noteworthy. Um, so I, 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 I've seen what it does to little, you know, between the ages of six to nine years old, right, what that does. So I absolutely believe in the power of that. Also, as a grandmother, I've seen one, what one school system does to my, you know, now seven-year-old granddaughter, how she would be sluggish to get ready for school, tired when she comes back from school, really, you know, not happy. And putting her in a different environment is as if it's a different child. Energy, no more needing, you know, any afternoon naps, you know, don't want to miss a day of school, even if she's ill, because, you know, the stories, it's that, you know, she is, her confidence, um, wow. So those are the two only places that I can speak from. You know, um, and I remember my own schooling experience. I remember when I was in first grade, the teacher writes the, the year, the date on the board, and it took me a while, I wasn't very good at math, it took me a while to figure out what was the year going to be when I'm done with school. Because this Mickey Mouse business, you know, I wanted to get done. I wanted to go where the big girls uh, were. So, you know, there it was. 1975, right, I was in grade one, and it was going to be 1987 when I'm completing my final year at school. Um, so yeah, I was in a hurry. <laughs> okay, um, one question from the back, and then there's one more online. Hello. Yeah. Hi. My name is Hilda. I'm from Uganda, and also part of the <laughs> Erasmus program. Uh, here with Professor Hanan. Um, so my question uh, is related to uh, leadership in the workplace and how it could work for women. Uh, because I know that in Africa, we're probably um, dealing with the patriarchal system. And then uh, looking at South Africa and all the inequality, I am thinking that you are in South Africa, you're probably dealing with uh, the white male, but then also the rigid uh, patriarchal system. So how do you get inter intergenerational leadership uh, to work for women in the workplace? We've got to create more welcoming spaces, Hilga. And part of it is around making sure that when we induct new entrants into the workplace, that we find them and we get them to be connected into a support space so that the culture they get both inducted and orientated into where, 
how are you going to be helped to navigate the culture of this organization so that we create a sense of belonging? We plug you into all of the different support systems, right? And that's part of what we're trying to achieve with a mentoring program and these communities of practice um, and other support and also what needs to happen externally, right? Uh, support systems that needs to be outside of the workplace as well, like the one you know I mentioned earlier. So I don't think there's enough work. The scale at which we need to do this, we need to be much more ambitious, audacious, aggressive um, about it. Um, and um, you know, I would like you to pick up that very question with my uh, sister and friend Mamelo here who would be possibly able to answer that question way better than I do. Please help. <laughs> Intergenerational support to smash the patriarchy. Yeah. In the workplace. <laughs> I mean, now I'm very happy I work in an organization where we are very deliberate about having black women and people because going to work and having to fight every day, like see me, feel, see me, hear me, see me, hear me, and then also outside gender equality, little less inequality, you know, like we have been, I've been very privileged in finding my way into a space where we have eliminated some of that ah, nonsense, bullshit. Um, but I think like, yeah, intergenerational, I, it's not a good thing. I mean, I think this is very, what's the word? Um, like a generalization. But something that I found is that in, there are so few spaces for us right, black people, women, whatever, in these organizations, that we have to fight each other. We find ourselves fighting each other for them as opposed to fighting white people for them, right? Because it's true. It's true. You rather step on me than step on Mary Jane, right? And then we find ourselves in situations where, you know, like, I find grown people gatekeeping spaces and not letting us in or giving us a step in or saying, okay, Mamelo, this is how you get ahead. This is, you know, giving me tips so that kind of helping me cover some groundwork, which I think is imperative as people, people who have the experience and who have the knowledge to pave it forward and, in, and like, you know, giving me some shortcuts if I can call it that, um, you know some of the tricks of the trade. You know some of the things that I'm going to go for, through. So instead of leaving it me, for me to have to, yeah. you know, I think that's like a beautiful thing that we can do for each other. And I wish got you. Got there was you. more of that. You've just reminded me of something that I just want to end off with uh, for Helga, Dominic. So Helga, part of how to how to battle and dance with patriarchy. So I was very aware that the things that I'm doing, you know, um, and doing it without permission, if you like, but because there's a need in the system, um, I needed to be very mindful about how I set up the intervention so that it cannot be killed off by you didn't ask me, and just because I want to be spiteful, I'm going to show you who's the boss, right? So we had one of these particular experiences where we developed a women's leadership awakening series, right? A, a women's leadership development program. And we had our first webinar in August two years ago. And on the morning of the webinar, I get an email from my boss saying, I don't know anything about this. This thing can't go ahead, right? Um, I write back on the email. I say, um, well, I did brief you on this, if you see the email of X date. 
and this initiative don't belong to your department. It's actually an organizing committee of women, these are their names, um, that are the champions behind this. Um, and so it's not ours to kill. Right? So planting things in different parts of the system so that when you anticipate attacks, uh, blockages of particular kinds, you, you plant it in particular ways. So we've got a gender desk and, you know, said, okay, we'll plant some things there, so you need to be, you know, politics with a big P and a small P, right? And uh, not get dissuaded by, you know, how power manifests um, and, you know, if power, if people want to flex their muscles, um, you know, you, you, play it, you play the game very differently, making sure you keep the large objective in mind. So that part of staying alive is because, you know, people that drive change hard, the system often just tolerates you. Right? The system will eject you. I've been ejected. I know how that works. Right? So one's got to be very mindful about how you are very tactical in designing these pieces of work. It's never about you. It's not about your ego. It's about what's the larger agenda, who are the coalitions for change, who are the other people that need to, you know, be in the front, when are you needing to be in the back, you know, how do you take up space, how do you build alliances, you know, so that when you need to pick up the phone and make an important call and you need a yes on the other side, that you can get it. Okay. It's a fantastic note to finish on, I think. Um, okay. You've given us so much to think about in terms of strategies for hope and optimism, and thank you ever so much for delivering the inaugural lecture and to everyone here for the questions. If you'd like to join us all downstairs for a reception, you'd be very, very welcome. But before we move out of here, please join me in a huge round of applause for Shanaz. Thank you.